colleagues from the media, good afternoon. Yesterday, on the 1st of July, after a long process, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted the UN Security Council Resolution Number 2532. This resolution underlines, among others, immediate cessation of hostilities in all situations on UN agenda, requests all parties to conflict to undertake humanitarian pause, requests UN Secretary General to accelerate COVID-19 response, and update the UN Security Council on efforts to mitigate COVID-19, request peacekeeping operations or PKOs to support host countries to facilitate access for humanitarian aid and ensure the safety and health of personnel in PKO operations. France as President of the UN Security Council for June 2020, acknowledged that Indonesia has constructively contributed to the adoption of this resolution through efforts such as offering middle ground solution, including by providing reverence to the UN General Assembly Resolution 74 270 74 slash 270 on COVID-19, which is adopted on the 2nd of April 2020, which was initiated by Indonesia with five other UN members. And consistently convincing Indonesia, consistently convincing all parties on how the resolution will be instrumental to the achievement of humanitarian pause and the UN Secretary General's call for global ceasefire. Colleagues, vaccine is the silver bullet to effectively deal with COVID-19. Currently, countries around the world are in the race to develop COVID-19 vaccine and medicine. But yesterday, more than 149 vaccines are being developed globally. On the Indonesian part, we have also worked hard to develop COVID-19 vaccine, both through national effort as well as with international partner. In my previous briefing, I mentioned that Indonesia has established a national consortium to develop vaccine for COVID-19. And to talk more about this issue today, I'm accompanied by Professor Ali Kufron, Ali Kufron Mukti, Chair of the Indonesian Consortium on Research and Innovation of COVID-19. Professor Kufron will elaborate on COVID-19 vaccine development in Indonesia. While Professor Wiku Adisasmito is also with us to convey some further updates. Colleagues, over the past week, I have three press briefings that is including this one today. Therefore, I will not repeat what I conveyed on ASEAN issues as I have mentioned them in my two previous press briefings. Today, I will focus on four issues. Palestine, women, peace, and security. Third is on update on the Rohingyas people and Aceh. And then fourth is update on the Indonesians returning. So let me start with the first, that is on the Palestine issue. We are closely following the development on the ground including development on the 1st July 2020. As you know, Indonesia has been steadfast in mobilizing support from the international community to prevent and reject Israel's annexation of the West Bank. The call for the rejection to the annexation, among others, are conveyed in my letter on 
27 of May 2020. And I received many positive responses from many countries, including South Africa, Brunei, Malaysia, China, Japan, Russia, Tunisia, Vietnam, Egypt, Jordan, Ireland, France, and many others, as well as from the Secretary General of the United Nations and Secretary General of the OIC. In their response, they conveyed several important points. First is the appreciation toward Indonesia's consistent principal position to support Palestine. Second, support for Indonesia's effort to mobilize the international community to prevent and reject the annexation plan. Third, support for the peaceful and sustainable effort to achieve a two-state solution. And fourth, shared concern that the annexation will not only threaten regional and global stability, but also harm efforts to effectively mitigate COVID-19. In addition to those efforts, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia is also in communication with the Indonesian Parliament to garner wider support for Palestine from parliaments from around the world. The Indonesian government and parliament are united on the issue on Palestine, as is all the people of Indonesia. Yesterday, initiated by the Indonesian parliament, 215 215 members of parliament from 34 countries signed a joint statement against Israeli's annexation of Palestinian territories. This joint statement has been conveyed to leaders of the International Parliamentary Forum, such as IPU, PUIC, APA, and IPA. This illustrates a stronger international solidarity and commitment to the Palestinian people and support to safeguard the two-state solution. Colleagues, my next issue is on women, peace, and security. The issue of women empowerment is an important element in Indonesian foreign policy. Indonesia is very active on the issue of empowering female peacekeepers, as well as on women as agents of peace and prosperity. Last year, Indonesia took two bold initiatives. One is the initiative to host the first regional training for women, peace and security to strengthen the capacity of 66 young women diplomats from the region in the peacemaking processes. Two is the initiative in hosting dialogue on the role of women in building and sustaining peace together with the Minister of Women Affairs of Afghanistan, Hasina Safi, and women leaders from Afghanistan. Indonesia efforts on this important issue do not stop there. In the beginning of this year, as a follow-up of last year's initiative on empowerment for Afghan women, I flew to Kabul and inaugurated the establishment of the Afghanistan-Indonesia Women's Solidarity Network. This network provides an important platform to step up cooperation and exchange views on how women can play a larger role in the peace processes and beyond. And yesterday, Indonesia hosted a webinar on the role of women negotiators and mediators in the maintenance of regional peace and security with more than 800 participants from around the world. During the webinar, 
I mentioned that it is important to include women peacemakers, not only in times of conflict, but throughout the whole spe spectrum of peace from preventive to resolution. This role becomes more important now amid so many global uncertainties. In the webinar on the role of women negotiators and mediators in the maintenance of regional peace and security, I underline that this is high time to promote three key aspects. First is to change the culture and mindset, mindset and create a safe and enabling environment for women to contribute to society and empower other women. Second, to enhance the capacity of women in peace building effort. And third, to foster like-minded networks. It is time for our region, Southeast Asia, to have its own network of women negotiators and mediators, as all regions already have one. Still on the issue of women, peace and security, Indonesia also tried its best to mainstream women, peace and security issue in ASEAN. During the ASEAN Political Security Council meeting, or APSC meeting, on the 24th of June 2020, I propose that issue of women, peace and security to be included in action lines of the APSC blueprint. At the global level, Indonesia is very active in this issue, among others through the United Nations, Women Foreign Ministers Network, and the Global Alliance of Regional Women Mediators Network that was launched last year on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. All this effort will cul culminate, inshallah, in Indonesia bigger plan, that is to establish Southeast Asia Network on Women Peace Negotiators and Mediators later this year. Colleagues, my next issue is on updates on the Rohingya peoples in Aceh. I have conveyed this issue in my briefing last Tuesday, 30th of June, and now I would like to provide some further updates. Colleagues, yesterday, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, together with the National Task Force for Refugees, departed to Lok Samawi to coordinate efforts on the ground. Today, the team visited the refugee at their shelter in Lok Samawi. And based on this visit, I can share with you some updates. First, the plan to move the refugee from immigration office uh, in Kampong Punteut to Balai Latihan Kerja Lok Samawi has been postponed to allow for better preparation of the new shelter. Second, two of the Rohingyas in Lok Samawi uh, Two of the Rohingyas now are in Lok Samawi Hospital. Uh, they are in good health and have been tested non-reactive for COVID-19. However, further medical checkup will be done to those two that are now in hospital. The team also met the representative of the UNHCR on the ground and received information from the 99 Rohingya people that only 42 are carrying the UNHCR card. So I repeat that from the information from the UNHCR, among 99, 42 are holding the UNHCR card. And then on the 5th of July, so 
Yeah, on the 5th of July, the UNHCR will begin the registration process for the 99 Rohingyas, and this will help to ensure their protection under UNHCR. Colleagues, my last point is on the update of the status of the Indonesian returnees per yesterday, 1st July 2020. From 18 March to 1st of July, 121,638 Indonesians have returned home. This is an additional of 4,068 people in a week of 3.5% increase. 87,777 Indonesian have returned from Malaysia so far. So we are seeing an increase of 3.6% from last week. 24,649 Indonesian crews have returned from 33 countries and arriving in Indonesia through five entry points in Jakarta and Bali. And this is an additional of 382 people compared to last week. So there is 1.6% increase. While another 9,212 Indonesian have returned home via self-repatriation from 53 countries. And this number also include 17 Indonesian returning from France yesterday. In regard to our assistance to Indonesian abroad in need, between 18 March to 1st of July 2020, the Indonesian Embassy, Consulate General and Consulate in Malaysia have distributed a total of 308,733 packages of basic need. Indonesian diaspora in Malaysia also help in contributing and providing an additional 142,365 packages. Those in total in Malaysia, they are 451,098 packages distributed. Then if we combine with the rest of the region, including in the Middle East, Asia, Pacific, Europe, America, and Africa, we managed to provide 522,086 packages globally. So colleagues, I will stop here, and now I would like to invite Professor Gufron to convey his presentation. I thank you very much. Prof, silakan. Good afternoon, colleagues from the media. Thank you very much, Her Excellency, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ibu Ratno Marsudi, the Chair of Expert Team of the National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation, Prof. Viku Adisasmita. Good afternoon, colleagues from international media. Thank you for joining us. I hope everyone is healthy and doing well. The breakout of COVID-19 pandemic occurred simultaneously around the globe has caught us by surprise. To date, the number of positive cases has yet to decrease in Indonesia and consequently will claim more victims if not properly handled. One of these avenues to handle the spread of COVID-19 is through vaccination. Therefore, ascertaining the 265 million Indonesian people to have access to efficacious vaccine is paramount. Thus, in today's press briefing, I would like to focus on the national efforts towards self-reliance on the access to safety 
an efficacious vaccine for COVID-19 pandemic that is conducted through our own national collaboration or under cooperation with other countries or entities. Vaccine and national health security. First, I would like to stress that the end of the tunnel of pandemic COVID-19 are vaccine and medicine. While the effective medicine is yet to be found, vaccine development that is self-reliant, fast and effective is pertinent in securing the state of health and livelihood of the Indonesian people. As our world becomes more exposed to diseases, viral based pandemic will likely to occur anytime. And now we listen, you know, the uh, another flu and disrupt all the development progress we have achieved. COVID-19 has served as the test case for the national resilience against the threat from infectious diseases. A country is prone to threat from diseases when it has limited capability in developing vaccine. As such, Indonesia's ability to produce vaccine will provide a sense of security in protecting the interests and survival of our nation. Indonesia has the capability and experience when it comes to vaccine production and distribution. Our pharmaceutical company, Bio Pharma, has successfully obtained WSO pre-qualification to produce and distribute polio vaccine to more than 118 countries around the globe, including member state of organization of Islamic cooperation, and we also as the center of uh, excellence. An establishment of national consortium to develop local vaccine. Then second, let me touch upon national consortium that is established to prevent, detect, and respond quickly in mitigating COVID-19 through research and innovation. National consortium is of collaboration between national pharmaceutical company, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Research and Technology, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, state-owned enterprise like Biopharma, and a number of research departments from various universities, spearheaded by Ekman Institute for Molecular Biology for development and production of a local vaccine. We may aware that there are three methods or platforms in developing vaccine. Namely, an activated virus platform, protein recombinant platform, and genetic platform by using DNA or mRNA virus. The National Consortium is currently developing recombinant protein subunit vaccine using the coronavirus strain found originated in Indonesia. And this method is chosen because we have technologically and experience, and no need to produce, you know, more viruses. And our research have already accustomed to develop the site vaccine platform. It goes well with the necessary facilities prepared by Biopharma. Once it is ready to be produced and, of course, distributed. The research, development, and production of local vaccine are deeply intertwined as these efforts are aimed to find particular type of vaccine suitable for Indonesia's coronavirus strain, which may have different features compared to other strains. National Consortium has submitted 10 to 16 whole genome sequencing from Ekman and also Erlanga University to GIZ, Global Platform for Global Influenza Virus Data, in which three are classified as unidentified strains and one is identified as type G. Vaccine usually takes years to develop. Nevertheless, provided the emergency situation, we are currently in national consortium project the expected timeline to develop local vaccine is around 18 months down the road. 
Such expedited development time will not certainly be pursued as the expense of the safety and efficaciousness of the developed vaccine. To date, National Consortium has identified the virus spike protein derived from the Indonesian coronavirus strain. Further, the identified spike for protein will undergo cloning process prior to be a subject to preclinical pre -clinical trial. The preclinical trial process will start at the end of 2020. And of course, if it is a little bit, you know, extended, maybe at the beginning 2021, and will be followed by several clinical trial in the year or early 2021. To ensure it is safety and efficacy prior it is used, and of course the expected result for our own and locally, you know, found of the virus will be on mid-2021. The whole process is paramount not only to determine whether or not to develop vaccine is effective to battle the COVID-19, but also whether the developed vaccine is safe to be used on person and will not entail any adverse effect. Safe reliance on access or safety and efficacious local vaccine. Third, the development of local vaccine is in line with our president's instruction to promote Indonesian's health security. The capacity to develop and produce local vaccine will enhance our safe reliance on access to safety and efficacious vaccine to battle the COVID-19. As explained above, our national consortium is currently developing the protein recombinant platform, while for the other platforms, Indonesia is also currently pursuing international cooperation in vaccine development and production, with the assistance, of course, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Indonesia's national pharmaceutical company, Bio Pharma, is working closely with Sinovac to explore potential cooperation in development and, in development and production of inactivated virus platform, which is platform number one. And it is scheduled clinical trial phase three in July 2020. Where is Calpio Pharma is in cooperation with Genesin from South Korea for the development and production of COVID-19 vaccine, particularly using the NA virus platform or platform number three. Now under discussion also involving Indonesia Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Health and also FDA scheduled clinical trial phase two in August 2020. The collaboration with international partners is complementary to efforts in developing local vaccine to achieve various aims such as fast, effective, and self-reliance of the availability of the COVID-19 vaccine. And of course, this also aim to fill in the gap on availability and access of vaccine prior to the production of local vaccine. And also for complementing the option for vaccine types. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, PP POM, also support Indonesian plan to collaborate with other potential partners such as CEPI. And based on the latest WHO data already mentioned and you know, mentioned by Her Excellency, our Minister for Foreign Affairs. And there are more than 120, around 125 vaccine candidates in clinical trial or clinical preclinical trial phase. However, we always have to bear in mind that the goal is to establish a national safety lines on the access of safety and efficacious vaccines. As such, we have to ensure that the international cooperation in development and production of vaccine will truly benefit both countries or both partners. Of course, benefit for Indonesia 
and not merely as the place to conduct clinical trial for potential market only. In the medium and long run, we must ascertain that sustainability of vaccine safety line efforts, the outbreak of COVID-19, is one tough lesson learned for us that we need to strengthen our health security and accelerate the capacity of our health industry through development of raw material for medicine, vaccine, and biopharmaceuticals. That is all from me, and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Gufron, for your presentation. Uh, colleagues, now time to respond to question we received from eight media, that is CCTV, Sky News, Associated Press, IF, AFR, AFR, Bloomberg, VOA, Manichi Simbun, and Moroccan News Agency. Of course, Professor Gufron will answer questions uh, related to the development of vaccine in Indonesia. Professor Viku will deliver some updates on technical details, and I will answer questions related to foreign policy. So let me start by responding the question from CCTV on the China's cooperation with Indonesia, especially at the post-pandemic period. Colleagues, China is one of the important trade and investment partner for Indonesia. And I have provided the explanation on cooperation with China during the pandemic in my previous briefing. And for post-pandemic, I do believe that the good cooperation with China will continue and expediting economic recovery, including through development of health industry in Indonesia. And on top of China, Indonesia also discussed effort to strengthen post-pandemic cooperation, among others, with Japan, ROK, the US, ASEAN, the UAE, Australia, and many others. And then the question from Voice of America and Moroccan News Agency on the AU's safe travel list and policy on Indonesia's border, I must say that its country or group of countries have their respective policies based on respective circumstances and interests. Speaking of Indonesia, our border are still closed for non-essential travels. Meanwhile, for the essential travels, foreigners must still comply with the Minister of Law and Human Rights Regulation number 11, 2020. So 11-2020. Next, the question from the Australian Financial Review on the Australia response to ASEAN travel corridor. Colleagues, the issue of ASEAN travel corridor was raised by President Widodo and other leaders of ASEAN during the 36th ASEAN summit last Friday. The issue was brought up again by the ASEAN Foreign Minister during the recent special ASEAN Australia Foreign Minister's meeting on COVID-19 on the 30th of June. Australia and ASEAN have shared views on the importance of the exchange of the best practices of travel corridors since Australia is now working with New Zealand to prepare the same arrangement. And then the question from Moroccan Peace, uh, Press Agency on the health protocols that will be deployed for future travelers from abroad who wish to go to Indonesia. Colleagues, I believe I have addressed this issue in my previous press briefing. Indonesia has implemented health protocol for Indonesian returning to Indonesia as stipulated in circular letter of the Ministry of Health number 338 slash 2020. The same protocol is applied for foreigners. That is not all foreigners, colleague. 
for foreigners that which are regulated by regulation of Minister of Law and Human Rights number 11 slash 2020. And as for the arrangement of health protocol for travel corridor, the discussion are still going on right now. And then the question of the Associated Press regarding what step is Indonesia taking to ensure it will have access a vaccine when it becomes available. I think in terms of vaccine, Professor Gufron has explained to you in his presentation. So I don't want to repeat again on the uh, development of uh, vaccine, both our development, national development as well or as how we cooperate with the international partners. Next question is the Australian Financial Review on China response regarding UNCLOS in the Chairman Statement uh, of ASEAN. Colleagues, the ASEAN Chairman Statement reflects ASEAN priority issues and commitment, both regionally and internationally. Mentioning UNCLOS in ASEAN Chair Statement is not something new. It was mentioned in previous ASEAN Chair Statement. In fact, ASEAN has consistently referred to UNCLOS 1982 as the legal basis for the peaceful settlement of the dispute in the South China Sea. And all parties to UNCLOS, including China, has the obligation to comply with the rules stated in UNCLOS 1982. Now I will answer question from VOA on Indonesia's views regarding U.S. State Department's Trafficking in Persons report. Colleague, it is in the interest of all countries to focus effort to settle transnational organized crime, including trafficking in person. So stronger international cooperation is needed since the crime is transboundary in nature. On our part, Indonesia remains highly committed to work with all relevant stakeholders in combating trafficking in person and people smuggling, both through regional and international cooperation. Indonesia's strong commitment, among others, is reflected in our continuous effort in the Bali process. And as co-chair of the Bali process, Indonesia continues to promote discussion and practical cooperation in the region on the transnational uh, crime and the people, sorry, the people, uh, people smuggling and trafficking in person. As I convey to you that based on the humanitarian consideration, we temporarily receive 99 Rohingyas. And at the same time, the Indonesian police also are now investigating any possible crime of people smuggling and trafficking in person. And then next is the question from VOA again on whether Indonesia will seek clarification to Chinese government on the Uyghur case. Colleague, as good partners, Indonesia and China continue to engage in discussion on various issues, including on the Uyghur issue. Indonesia has also brought the concern of Indonesian stakeholders on the situation of Uyghur in Xinjiang. And during the discussion, we also exchange views on effort to promote tolerance. Last but not least, to respond question by Mainichi Simbun in regard to Indonesia's views on the report of Beijing establishing an air defense zone as part of its territorial expansion, again, 
I think I have addressed this issue before in my briefing on the 4th of June, but I will repeat what I said. I quote, with regard to China plan to claim an air defense identification zone or ADIS, I have heard about the issue since 2015. However, I haven't heard any official statement on this matter, so I cannot comment further." Unquote. On a separate note, the chairman's statement of the 36th ASEAN Summit also underlines the importance of maintaining and promoting peace, security, stability, safety, and freedom of navigation in and over flight above South China Sea. That is all from me, and now uh, I give the floor back to Professor Kufron, and then after that I will invite Professor Viku to respond to some question and also convey some updated uh, to you colleagues. Thank you very much. Bro? Thank you. So I would like to respond the questions. First question is from Sky News. What is the current progress on COVID-19 vaccine? What formulas are you looking at? And timeline for development. So the progress on COVID-19 vaccine development for June 30, 2020 is that the gene coding for the spike S and necrocapsid N protein from the SARS-CoV-2 Indonesia isolate has been successfully amplified. And some version of the S genes, such as the receptor binding domain of full length, have also been successfully amplified and cloned into a basic factor or carrier and currently, we are in the process of transfer cloning to mammalian cell strain factor expression. And general regions are available, but only few are still need to import from abroad. And supporting equipment for protein production is still in the process of uh, delivery. And culture and propagation of SARS-CoV-2 virus from Indonesian isolates have been carried out and will be prepared as a positive control and immunogenicity testing of the experimental animals. We are optimistic that Indonesia can have its own COVID vaccine soon. And about the formula, of course, as we know, that there are three platforms in developing vaccine, namely an activated virus platform, protein recombinant platform, genetic platform, by using DNA or mRNA virus. So we use this formula, the three platform we are using and developing COVID-19 vaccine. For an activated vaccine, we are collaborating, collaborating with international agencies and also for the genetic platform, we also doing the same thing, having a collaboration with international partners. But for protein recombinant platform, we are using our own purely, and we are optimistic that in the year 2021 and early 2021, this will finish for, you know, in laboratory, an estimated clinical trial with Biopharma in trimester two in the year 2021. And of course, the vaccine development must fulfill the value of fast or speed, effectiveness, and self-reliance. Ladies and gentlemen, question number two, from Sky News, how much will it cost and how long will it take 
to vaccinate the whole population against COVID-19 once a vaccinated is de one vaccine is developed. The cost, of course, enormous and take a lot of effort from various parties, government and academicians and researchers, research centers, private sectors, as well as investors. And the our formula also to calculate is based on what we call it Firo formula. Firo formula is one minus one divided by rho is commonly used to calculate and to count the number of people who need to be vaccinated under row condition. And rho condition in Indonesia, namely one person, may transmit to three, three people. Those we need vaccin vaccinated people are two divided by three of 265 million equal to 166, 176 million. And if each person need two shots of vaccination, then it needs 352 million units of vaccine. And if the price of vaccine is five US dollar or 75,000, then we need at least 26.4 trillion rupiah. So I think, of course, after, after the vaccine is ready, we need at least one year to vaccinate the two-thirds of our population, which is the number of needed vaccinated population. Now, we move to question number three. What is Indonesian current role in vaccine development and production and have any companies approach Indonesia for partnership? At this moment, Indonesia is one among the four countries in the world that is making concerted efforts to develop its own COVID-19 vaccine. Other countries, of course, include China, United States, France, UK, and of course, various companies have approved, approached Indonesia for this COVID-19 vaccine development from many countries, and also we already explained previously. And therefore, to accelerate the development and availability of the vaccine COVID-19 in Indonesia, Ministry of Research, Technology and National Agency for Research and Innovation has initiated the COVID-19 vaccine development team working together with various ministries, including Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to, as soon as possible, to produce, to develop and produce our own vaccine with local isolation of the virus. And of course, that it is very important through developing the capability for Indonesia to develop vaccine using domestic resources, encouraging cooperation with countries that have COVID-19 vaccine development institution that are qualified and have measurable performance in the field, increasing the ability of domestic industries to produce COVID-19 vaccine and supporting cooperation between domestic industries and abroad for accelerating vaccine production. And now we come to the last questions from Bloomberg. What is the motivation for making Indonesia on vaccine? Is it because Indonesia worried it will be shut out or last in line for one made by the US or China? Indonesia has made concentrated efforts to produce its own vaccine since Indonesia has to protect its people. And our national health security is very important. Then, of course, when we are talking about the money involved, when at least 352 million shops our unit of vaccine should be produced or conducted. And each 
you need a vaccine price at least five US dollar. So again, it needs 26 trillion point four rupiah. So this, therefore, we have to be able to, you know, produce our own uh, vaccine. As such, it will be very burdening for Indonesia. Indonesia has to avoid such a situation and also encourage self-reliance among its people and also researchers to have developed its own COVID-19 vaccine. Indonesia has a large population, 265 million approximately. While taking measures to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic, Indonesia has also to be able to accelerate its economic recovery. As such, fast, effective, efficient measures need to be taken strategically. Indonesia considers COVID-19 is highly strategic commodity and the production capability and capacity of biotech companies in the world is also, we know, is limited and global supply chains is also have challenge. Therefore, it is necessary for Indonesia to develop its own COVID-19 vaccine and it will be by Indonesia, from Indonesia to Indonesia. I think that is all and thank you very much. Her Excellency, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ibu Rukno Marsudi, Chief Executive of National Vaccine Development, Prof. Ali Gufron, and esteemed uh, foreign correspondents and journalists. Uh, this pandemic is a scientific challenge, but it's also a test of national uh, unity. We must act in the interest of the solidarity and our shared uh, humanity. We have a shared responsibility to ensure that all people have access to the tools to protect themselves, especially those who are most at risk, those who live in uh, communities. And that is the calling for me, uh, Prof. Gufron, and the team of experts in the task force. Our government and Indonesian scientists have to support communities with the information we have to facilitate, make it easier for people to make good choices, healthy choices. The choice to stay away from the COVID-19 and overcome the pandemic with powerful tools, behavior change and science-based uh, policies. Unlike any other crisis we have faced before, the COVID-19 pandemic started from a pathogenic microscopic living creature staggering the world. Soon enough, what commenced as a public health emergency had caused a crisis in myriads of sectors impacting every single individual. This is the time in which science act as the pillar foundation. The scientists and the intellectuals are rushed in the service of others contributing in efforts to mitigate the outbreak. The emergence of this pandemic has highlighted the importance of one big data system, one that the President has also emphasized recently. The integrated public health data acts as the base reference for policy making. Better data, better policy making. For more than a month, the National Task Force has been adopting the Zonation Strategy, mapping risk regionally. With this evaluation method, there is a lot that we could grasp in, rather than counting solely on the national tally. Per 28 June 2020, there are 53 red zones with the highest transmission risk, Compared to the 31st of May data a month ago, Indonesia has succeeded in converting 55 other red to become orange or yellow zones. Out of the regions, 
falls into the yellow and green zones with the lowest risk of transmission and even no case detected at all. And this happens as the national testing capacity keeps on climbing. For further information, please refer to our official site, www.covid19.go.id. Now, I will proceed to answering questions from the media. The first is from Sky News, AFR, and Mainichi. Indonesia is currently experiencing record numbers of confirmed coronavi uh, coronavirus cases. How will you slow the rate and protect the population while waiting months for a possible vaccines? When do you think will be the peak? And why is East Java hit the hardest? And what measures have you taken to handle that? So East Java province consists of 38 districts and cities that have a varied number of cases. With the highest cases in Surabaya, it is 193 cases per 100,000 population, while the lowest cases are in Banyuwangi district, amount 1.7 cases per 100,000 population. Also, East Jaffa has more than 16 districts or cities with low and medium risk than districts or cities with high risk. Mitigating COVID-19 in Indonesia must be done responsibly and transparently. The crisis must be navigated with the evidence or database policy. By identifying the status of each zone, the decision-making could be done more responsibly with clearer aim and goals. The stratification system can also provide information to local and pertinent authorities in ratification of suitable protocols tailor-made for each uh, sector. The second question from Sky News. There are around 55,000 confirmed detected COVID-19 cases in Indonesia, given that 40 to 45 percent of cases may be asymptomatic, do you have any figures for the potential risk, uh, real infection rate? Uh, currently, Indonesia is focusing on monitoring each district and cities based on 15 sub-indicators from three main indicators, including epidemiology, public health surveillance, and healthcare indicators, as we already mentioned uh, before. For the last few weeks, it is recorded that the number of the confirmed cases in Indonesia is more than 1,000 cases. This number is increasing due to the number of the testing increases too. For figuring the potential real infection rate, it has been described by showing the incidence rate and positivity rate. For instance, the incidence rate shows the proportion of new cases in high-risk population. Likewise, the positivity rate also describes the proportion of positive cases in people who have been tested. For the last few weeks, it is recorded that the number of confirmed cases in Indonesia is more than 1,000 cases. This number is increasing due to the number of the testing increases too, as I mentioned before. However, if we see the trend of positivity rate is decreasing. This number shows the proportion of the number of confirmed cases and number of people who are tested. For example, on June 15 to 21st of 2020, the positivity rate is 14% and June 22nd to 28th 2020 is 12%. The third question from Sky News, given the record numbers and the long wait for a vaccine, will the government consider stricter lockdowns or social distancing? For the last uh, two months, we have been analyzing zonation classification according to risk of virus transmission looking at the real-time number of cases in each individual city and region. The data analyzed 
then used for ratification of policies and protocols to be implemented to pertinent, uh, 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 pertinent sectors. We conduct routine coordinations with local authorities, especially for regional task force and the red zones with highest risk of transmission. The National Task Force several times with the President himself also paid an impromptu visit to these red zones areas in order to observe the situation and give directive commands urging better response to local cases. In red zones, the government must enact more stringent restrictions with closing almost all public places, including schools, offices, transportation hubs, and shopping centers. The only places allowed to open are staple food groceries, gas station, and health facilities such as clinics, hospitals, and pharmacies. Given the number in testing capacity, Indonesia has today over 20,000 tests carried out per day. It will surely be congruent with the increment of the national case tally. Moreover, we also need to calculate the ratio between the number of the total cases with Indonesian population density. Hence, the positivity rate is another important benchmark we should all look into. The uncertainties toward vaccine massive production are still looming. Therefore, we should emphasize more on the prevention and transmission control measures. I see all elements have hand in hand called upon healthier lifestyle and hygiene, and we will continuously urge tirelessly to be mindful towards social distancing, enacted protocols to protect our own self and other around us. The fourth question is from Mainichi Simun. How to make the economy and public health go hand in hand as instructed by the President several days ago. According to the task force, which one is more important, the economy or public health? I think for a little too many times, we have reiterated the importance of both sectors repeatedly, that there is no trade-off between economy and public health. For the well-being of humankind comprises both status of health and status of economy. There is essential element for both things to go accordingly, and this is behavior change. Again, I urge not just Indonesians, but also the world to abide by health protocols. Preventing the transmission rate from mounting and the businesses from going defunct are two main concerns we have from the very since beginning. Hence, in order to undergo productive activities, all sectors must follow sets of health protocols as prerequisite to reopen gradually. Among them are the requirements to provide hand wash, sanitizer, temperature checking, disinfect the rooms and equipment after use, and assure that the social distancing is carried out with the maximum capacity of the public health place in the yellow zone can only be packed 50% of total normal capacity. For instance, in state-owned enterprises about to allow for work back in office, the employees need to indicate their COVID testing result first. The integrated system that we have can assess precisely the situation of each region according to the number of cases detected. By identifying the risk contained in the regions, we could set up the protocols which one needs to remain stringently restricted and which ones are already allowed to open up gradually for certain sectors. This is one form of adaptation in response to this tough epidemic. The fifth question is from Mainichi Simbun. Latest data, how many doctors and medical doctors passed away due to COVID-19? 
up until this 1st of July. According to the Ministry of Health, it has been reported that 32 medical doctors and 17 nurses passed away associated with this outbreak. May blessing and God grace be upon them and the families left behind. Doctors and dentists and nurses are among those with highest risk to contract coronavirus. The frontliners are forever appreciated and honored. Those are the ones who risk their own life and well-being in the service of others. Therefore, Indonesia has been striving to fulfill the necessity toward full coverage of PPE. It was such a saddening situation to hear a couple medical workers was once reported to take care of patients without appropriate protective gears. As Indonesia has been able to produce its own high quality coverall cones, we truly hope that it could fulfill domestic needs and many health facilities could utilize it. We see a necessity to widely distribute our products fastly and we urge all pertinent institutions to hand in hand facilitate the process of it. So last point, science alongside the investment of technology and intellectual collaboration has taken us far in COVID-19 mitigation. With perseverance of innovation, Indonesia has established 100% domestically produced products among them are internationally certified PPE, the cover of guns, and the ventilators. Indonesia is also underway on vaccine and drug development in conjunctive collaboration with many other nations in accordance with WHO. We hope in the future Indonesia could be more independent in fulfilling the nation's need for medical facilities and beyond. There is no vaccine for coronavirus because this is our first coronavirus pandemic. The only weapon now is prevention. Collaboration in prevention measures, national unity, solidarity. Universal vaccines against respiratory pathogens are the holy grail of our dreams. Many decades we have passed thinking and hoping for a universal vaccine against influenza and that has not been achieved. Given the long-term threat presented by coronavirus and what we see out there in nature, that the long-term pursuit of more universal vaccines against, against coronavirus should be a long-term objective in the vaccine development community. But for now, we deal with SARS-CoV-2 and what we do need is a safe, is a safe and effective vaccine against this virus. We hope that such effective number two, safe and number three will be accepted by people around the world and be available for everyone who needs them. And this needs the agreement of the whole Indonesia to accept, vaccinate ourselves once the vaccine arrives. Before that happens, let's rehearse, strengthen our national consensus by doing three simple steps. Keep safe distance, wear mask, wash your hands, and it prevents all of us from all coronavirus. Let's stick together till the end. Thank you very much, and I would like to return this to Ibu Ratna. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Viku, and of course, thank you very much once again, Professor Gufron, and thank you to you all colleagues for participating in this today's press briefing. Inshallah, I will see you next week. And don't forget to stay healthy, stay strong, and stay united. See you next week. Inshallah. <laughs>